Coming to you from Northern California. Uh, negative K, nothing further. Just, uh... This is the Shots Fired Podcast. Back on that town property case, With your hosts, Sergeant Kyle Schoberg, retired police officer Mark Redlich, and Deputy Billy. We are America's leading law enforcement resource for training and tactics from experts in the industry. Here are your hosts. All right, guys, we're back here with the Shots Fired podcast at the TAC Ops Conference here in Washington, D.C., and we have with us Jay Wadsworth in our makeshift studio that we've been given to us, which is awesome. Um, Jay, we know that you're super busy here. You got a lot of classes going on. A lot of people want to do jujitsu and, and all the things that you have going on. So we're going to kick this off. Go ahead and introduce yourself to us. And what's your law enforcement background? All right, so my name is Jay Wadsworth. I'm the co-founder of Effective Fitness Combatives. Law enforcement wise, I've been a cop for over 20 years. I actually can retire in April, so I'm nice. pretty happy about that. Good for you. But, uh, I was on a SWAT team starting in 2008, and then 2012, I became the team leader of the team. I've been an ATL or team leader since uh, 2012, working up to currently position now. I'm a team leader on the team, and I'm one of the co-training uh, directors. In that meantime, I started fighting and doing jujitsu, and uh, I just kind of integrated in. But as a police officer, proactively, that's what I did when I was at work. I was just super proactive, going out there, making lots of stops, uh, warrant arrests, and it all would lead in progress stuff. You know, foot pursuits. You know, I they would always you know bust my balls at work. That <laughs> you know, how many foot pursuits are you gonna have this week? So, yeah. Whatever. So like, but those were learning experiences for me because getting all that hands on. Um, experience on the street has really driven how I've kind of done tactics uh, going forward in, in training. Yeah, no doubt. And I always say experience, you know, uh, um, mistakes come with experience and, you know, yes. so that's where you learn. And as instructors, we have to teach off of those experiences yeah, good or bad no doubt. And, and help teach. And that's important. Um, on top of being on SWAT, I'm a, a range instructor, related based training instructor, which is like SIMS, UTM, um, defensive tactics instructor, in 2015 into 16, I was asked by the Department of Criminal Justice Services, which is like post for New York. Mm -hmm. They govern all basic academies in New York State minus uh, the state police and NYPD. And I was kind of tasked with redoing and revamping their defensive tactics program, which is an 80 hour program. So I wrote that curriculum for them and I'm still the lead instructor on that. And we kind of built like a 12 to 15 man cadre and we go around the state and teach two week courses uh, three to four times a year for the, for, uh, the state of New York. Wow. And uh, as of January 2022, NYPD decided that they were going to fall under DCJ, uh, DCJS. Mm -hmm. So now... <coughs> We're going to be tasked with, you know, helping them manage their instructors as far as getting nice. them up. They'll be teaching our program there. So uh, that was kind of, kind of good too. So you're wow. busy. Yeah. So, so you're busy. busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it sounds like you got a really successful law enforcement career, but in addition to that, you're really involved in jujitsu. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I love Brazilian jujitsu. I'm a black belt in Brazilian jujitsu and I love it. And I, I kind of came a different route than probably most traditional jujitsu players where I started to work first in 2001. And then was like, I uh, had a couple incidents where like I was athletic. I played soccer collegiately. Like, um, I lifted and, but like, I didn't know how to fight. I didn't know how to wrestle well. And I had a couple incidents. I worked for a PD where back was two, three minutes away. And I was like, man, this guy wasn't really drunk. He could have been a handful for me. And like, yeah, he yeah. was aggressive. So I was like, I got to start learning how to do jujitsu. <laughs> But where I lived, uh, there was no black belt jujitsu players at that time in, in the, the Western New York area that I could train under. So we started kind of just getting a group of people together and kind of doing more MMA, uh, like UFC style. Fight. <laughs> and um, the, I'm really close to the PA border. So PA wrestlers and wrestlers in our area are really good. High school wrestlers is, is high school wrestling's pretty high level stuff. So like, 
I started training with a bunch of wrestlers and we started learning some jujitsu by driving six, seven hours to go to a seminar, coming back, implementing it for a month or two till we could save up money to go to another seminar and coming back. And then there was a guy that got promoted to uh, like a brown black belt in the area that some of my buddies went to, him and I had a falling out. So like I pretty much taught myself jujitsu over time with you know, like going to seminars. We didn't have all these videos. Like now BJJ Fanatics is out there. Like these guys could yeah. have all these high level guys like on screen watching. We didn't have that. So we were traveling, coming back and then just training hard, training four or five days a week, uh, kind of just piss pounding each other yeah. and then <laughs> learning jujitsu. Um, and it wasn't until about 2009 or 10, we formally like went under an association. We went, my really good buddy, uh, Robert Hugus, he's a retired New York State cop now. He was mm -hmm. uh, New York State police. He, he was a sergeant and ran the um, academy, uh, DT and PT program the last 10 years. He recently retired. He's actually it, teaches for me now for uh, combatives, um, the EFC combatives and for DCGS. He was one of Julio Fernandez's first black belts in no the kidding. US. Nice. So when I started, he was a black belt. <laughs> No kidding. Wow. And uh, he's been a huge mentor for me, like in, in the jujitsu phase now. But we ranked up under him and his association with Julio and BJJ uh, Revolution. And then we started getting that structured jujitsu. But, you know, I'd already been training jujitsu and wrestling, some sort of like uh, almost like freestyling it for, for years up to that yeah. point. So that's wow. kind of how I got to where I'm at. And then nice. in 2015, I, I got awarded my black belt under Julio and Rob. So. Uh, that's, that's my, my yeah. BGJ side. Nice. That's how uh -huh. that came about. Nice. Nice. So, um, how, like, where did the transition into teaching law enforcement Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Because obviously there's, you know, obviously training, I, I don't normal Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. And then there's Jiu Jitsu specifically for our industry for police. Yeah. So, you know, I got into Jiu Jitsu because I was training to do MMA fights. Mm -hmm. So like I was already kind of seeing a little bit of like jujitsu is awesome and the control is awesome and it's great for MMA and it's great for self-defense, but there is a little bit of difference that you, you have to integrate even for MMA. And then when we add like police, it's even more. Yeah. But like in 2009, I started seeing this big void in DT in 2002 or three, I went to like a PPCT instructor course and then I, I was a defensive tactics instructor and really I could wipe my ass with it and throwing it out. Cause yeah. it, was, uh, <laughs> it was just like one of those things where like, when I went to the academy, everything they taught you was like everything worked and you did no resistance and pressure points. Yeah, work. <laughs> we, yeah, we work, all know that. Work, yeah. So that's fine. Like if a pressure point works, it works. And then you take them into custody. Great. But if it fails, move on. What was my next option? Yeah. We started seeing like um, the difference between pain compliance failing like two thirds of the time versus complaint. Uh, good control techniques were efficient like two thirds of the time. And that's a big gap there, especially yeah. when we have like weapons and other people involved. So I was like, I wanted to kind of revamp DT and make it like jujitsu for police. And I was lucky because my chief at the time was a retired military guy and he, he was a big wrestler and into wrestling. So he told me, he's like, I don't care what the state's doing because the state was doing more of just like, uh, that like control hold stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. It was just like Basic. common PPCT type stuff. It wasn't PPCT, but it was like very similar. Yeah. And um, he's like, I don't care what the state's doing for our in-service stuff. I want you to create a program and I want it to be more like wrestling and jujitsu and, and MMA style stuff where we're, we're integrating that in. So he gave me like free reign to start doing it. That's so cool. I started doing like um, jujitsu for police. And in the beginning, like stuff I was teaching was good, but I was being too sporty. Hmm. I was teaching too much sport, not sport jujitsu, but like I was teaching too much jujitsu into policing, mm -hmm. too much of spending time on my back and too many in-depth techniques and sweeps and whatnot. And over periods of time, like starting to realize like, hey, our environment isn't really made for a bunch of the positions. Yeah. Now, the fundamentals of jujitsu in wrestling and Muay Thai are like tremendous for what we do. They're tremendous. We need to take those fundamentals and now how do we integrate them into what the environment we have, the unknowns, the weapon systems they may have, yeah. and the weapon systems we bring to all the fights. Yep, 100% suspects we know or don't know. Yeah. 
that mm. changes how we teach jujitsu and wrestling and Muay Thai into combatives. And that's, I think, where um, we've got a lot of attention is, hey, almost everyone that teaches for me is a jujitsu black belt with police experience, brown wow. or purple belt with high level tactical experience. Yeah. Right, so all the guys understand the difference of, okay, I'm a jujitsu guy, and here, we're gonna have to initially, and maybe even forever, lean on community gyms, civilian black belts and jujitsu gyms that aren't law enforcement. We're gonna have to lean on them to help us get better and, and train. Yeah, But like we also then need to have them get certified and instruct a curriculum that is gonna work on the street also. now. Being just a regular jujitsu blue belt at a gym is going to make you way better at control tactics. Way better. Yeah. But now, what's our awareness of weapons on the street? What positions work with weapons and don't work with weapons? And, and what positions allow us to stay mobile, uh, engage or disengage when we need? And that does change things on the street. Uh, I, I always get not, not hated on for this comment by, by jujitsu guys, but like the front mount if I'm by myself is a no go for me Yeah, on the street. And it's because I look at responses of human beings. So we take like psychology and sociology and human responses and I go to MMA class and I have say someone that's never trained to MMA come in, they come into class. And if we're training mount with strikes, mm -hmm. we're training mount control, we get three responses, three common responses from the guy on the bottom that's never trained before, which is primarily the amount of people we deal with on the street. They, they don't have training. Right. And two of those responses aren't necessarily bad or gonna hurt us too much. One, they roll to their stomach and they give up their back. Two, they push us away and that's not gonna be too much of uh, an, an issue. Mm -hmm. But the third response and very common response is the one that hampers our ability in police work. And that is the oh shit, I got to survive this position, bad yeah. guy, and he just bear hugs the top guy. Hmm. It limits his strikes, okay? But more so in police work, the problem is, now it limits my ability to disengage yeah. if a buddy is close. Yeah. It also limits my ability to now get to any tools that are on my belt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I do a live demo of that drill before I teach control tactics every time, and then it's super eye-opening. Yeah, that's opening to me just hearing that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Right, but that's a common response we get from guys that don't train a lot in an MMA gym. What do you think is going to be the difference on the street? Nothing. They're going to still yeah. get that same response from an untrained person on the street is just, I'm going to hang on and survive. Yeah. And that's a common response. So we need to understand, is that common response to the mounted position, which is in jiu-jitsu, most, most uh, competition jiu-jitsu mount is four points. Wrestling, I put a mount on, I run legs, and you're probably getting back points or at least maybe pinning the guy. Yeah. Right? So it's a dominant position, but it hampers our ability to be mobile. Can I disengage that dude right away if I need to go? And if he's wrapped around my waist, I can't. Yeah. Right? So I prefer to teach a, a modified knee on belly position. I teach knee on top. Very difficult to hold me there. I can transition. I can move. I can engage if I need to. I can disengage. Uh, my head's more up. I can be more aware of my surroundings. So we started doing position at a time. And it wasn't like overnight. Like, yeah. It wasn't like, hey, we're, we're jujitsu guys and we're teaching police how to use jujitsu. Yeah, we are. We're teaching them the fundamentals of jujitsu. Uh, but we're teaching them conceptually and with principles in our environment. And then all the weapon stuff comes in after that. Yeah. And it changes things. That's awesome. So it's almost like uh, it, it's almost like uh, your own form of like jujitsu, right? It's not it's not just jujitsu. It sounds like it's a a, a multitude of different uh, yeah, I think arts. It's, yeah, it's just how we integrate it. So like everything I learned in jujitsu, I can use on the street. It's just in what application I use it in. Yeah, in what positions work and versus what positions don't work. Again, I was talking to a guy I had in class yesterday um, about being able to stay mobile in dominant positions after class. And he goes, yeah, I first realized this when I took, a, I was fighting with a guy on the street and I took his back. And sometimes in jujitsu, you take their back and you put your back on the mat and he's laying yeah. on top of me and I'm working to choke the guy. Well, one, in law enforcement now, depending on what state you work for, but a lot of the states, choking a guy is deadly physical force. Yeah, they, they won't even allow it in most states anymore. Correct, which 
obviously is another topic in itself that we right. choke people in jujitsu gyms all the time and no one's dying. Yeah. <laughs> they live. So yeah. if we put it in deadly physical force, we got to tell the lawmakers I could that shoot the guy at that point. So yeah. I'm not saving any lives by using a chokehold. Right. Where I, I'm okay. Oh, you don't want me to choke a guy in like a soft hand or just actively resisting. Mm -hmm. Sure, fine. But a guy that's actively resisting and fighting with me. Yeah. If I could use it more in the intermediate weapons, that's going to save more lives than it's not. Yeah. Right. So that's like a whole nother topic that we can we could talk about at some other yeah. time. You know. But those are the types of things that we have to go down. So he ha has the guy on top of him. He's got his gun belt on, but he's trying to take the guy. He's got the guy's back, dominant four point position in jujitsu. But the guy's on top of him. And Which is uncomfortable position as a cop to be in. Correct. On an environment that could be gravel, it could be pavement, yeah, yeah. Uh, it could be in the middle of the road. Uh, and then what if his buddy's there now? Yeah. Because oh, we man. don't know. Yeah. Now, how do I get disengaged quickly? Yeah. Right? So we talk about distance management. Uh, we have to be able to engage and disengage. We talk about being able to be mobile. Those are concepts, right? Those are like what we call rules of the game. So for us, it, uh, EF combatives, it's going to be awareness is our first concept principle we teach. You have to be aware of everything. Your surroundings, the, the 45 flare, the elbow for weapon presentation, <laughs> how many people are around. Um, then we go to the ability to maintain, your ability to maintain staying mobile. You have to stay mobile. And if you can't get mobile from a position, that's a no-go for me. That's a no-go teaching that position because I have to be able to be mobile in our, our, our environment. I look at what you're doing is an absolute necessity for the evolution of law enforcement for yeah. cops protecting themselves. Yeah. The stuff that has been in some places are still being taught is not effective. So right. I look at what you're doing is phenomenal and absolutely necessary. You know, and it's too, we see these videos and they look horrible, right? Hey, the guy's punching him. He won't show me his hands. And I break down um, for combative specifically, like control tactics specifically you get three forms of resistance. Passive, which isn't usually an issue. We don't see much issue with that. The majority of actively resisting people is what we deal with. They're yeah. actively resisting our attempt to arrest them. They're not physically trying to assault us. Yep. They're yeah. trying to flee. They're the tucked arms underneath mm -hmm. guy, right? And then we have the actively assaultive guy. Now that obviously moves up in force, yeah. right? But that actively just resisting guy they're probably in the right level of force to be able to punch him and hit him at that point. He's resisting arrest. Uh, they probably haven't searched him yet. They don't have weapons he has, mm -hmm. but it looks bad. Yep. And they're probably not violating anything, mm -hmm. but it's just not efficient. Yeah. It's not effective. So it gives the appearance of a, an overuse of force because of the appearance of it. When really it's not, it's just they're not being effective with what they're attempting to do where if you have really good solid control tactics and you can add in strikes to try to change behavior or get a distraction together, then that's where we're seeing it be way more effective on the street. And like I said, we've been running the program I built for DCGS at the police department I work for. And um, we're a busy police department. Like we're, there's not a day goes by that there's not use of the force being filed on a daily basis at our department. Hands yeah. on use of the force, okay? And we have, I won't say zero issues, but like point zero 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 <laughs> issues yeah. since like 2009 or 10, because everyone understands their responsibility and a use of force, okay? Solo officer, here's how we control them on the top, here's how we take them down. Second guy comes in, he's got two places he can go. So our standard operating procedure is, We've got contact guys knee on top. Second guy goes to the legs and puts an anchor in or posts on the head. Third guy comes in and goes opposite of two. Mm -hmm. So now even if the person isn't super competent at what they're doing skill-wise, they know where they're going because that's how we, we do our, hmm. our awesome. arrests. There's no pig piles. Um, the older crew that didn't want to start doing it started seeing how efficient it was and how much easier it was for us to take people into custody. And so they started buying in that way. Now we're so young, the guys don't even know. They just learn it. And everyone that goes to the academy now learns it in yeah. New York. So whoever we get, wow, they, they already awesome. have they it. Have a and baseline. it's just a fresher when they're coming to work. Yeah. Right on. So, well, yeah. and look, honestly, like most cops that are sitting there punching people, punching in the rib cage, whatever, um, oftentimes they get hurt anyways, right? Like they break a, th a hand or yeah. a wrist or whatever, like they end up getting hurt themselves anyways. So unfortunately, I think a lot of agencies refuse to move to the jujitsu um, 
techniques for officers and because they think there's a liability attached to it. And I just don't think they're open-minded enough to understand that, like you just said, the way you guys are doing it, the percentage rate of uh, officers getting hurt is super, super low. And, and the suspects. And the suspects, yeah, yeah super, super low. So, yeah. I mean, I think it just comes down to people aren't educated, right? So I, getting the word out there on it is fantastic. That's yeah. the biggest thing is just educating people or they just don't know. Sometimes yeah. people don't know things and you have to explain them. I talk about like a uh, grand jury that I was a expert witness in for combatives portion of it. Let's talk about posting on the head versus striking the head. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people think, oh, they come down and I'm gonna post on this dude's head. Well, the human body has two solid control points, the head and the hips. If I can control them, sure, hands kill me, but I have to be aware of them. Mm -hmm. I know where they're at and I can give them attention if needed. But if I'm trying to get your hands behind your back before I control your hips and your head, it's gonna be a shit show. Like I'm never gonna be able to do it efficiently and it's not gonna look good, it's gonna yeah. be difficult. But if I can control the person first, then control hands, it's much easier. Hmm. We also talk about like uh, energy and that 90 to 100 second rule. And my buddy Matt uses currency as energy in fighting. And if I can tire that guy out, okay, that's my currency. Yeah. Huh. So like Makes we're sense. always in such a hurry to roll him to their stomach. Get on your stomach, get on your stomach, get on your stomach right now. Get your hands behind your back. Well, is it easier to stand up stomach down or is it easier to stand up if my stomach's facing up? It's much easier for me to build a house, do a push up if I'm stomach down yeah. than it is if I'm stomach up. I have less ways to stand up. So I'm never in a rush to roll that dude. I will get good pressure on his hips and his head. I will let him, for a, a better term, just kind of let him like sweat, cook Exert his energy, <laughs> yeah. Mentally just, he's done, it's done, we're at pressure. So pressure over pain. I just, people, there's two things people hate um, when they don't feel pain, so pain compliance. Yeah. They're hyped up on opiates, alcohol, whatever, they don't feel pain. Even if you don't feel pain, people hate when they can't see and they can't breathe. We can't go out and just blind everybody and choke them. <laughs> yeah. But pressure to the untrained person makes them feel that way. So I can have good pressure on your hips and good pressure on your head. I'm not hurting anybody. And that dude is freaking out. He wants this to be over with. Just take take away their ability to want to fight right away. Wow, that's we crazy. have more people give up. And I, I always tell people, I teach thousands of officers a year, travel across the country and train thousands of officers a year. And I always say in our debriefs, I want live feedback, good or bad. It worked or it failed. Mm -hmm. Okay, it failed, was it operator error or was it just something we gotta look at again? Okay, and then good. And I'll tell you what, I get more feedback that, hey, we went knee on top, my shin rides on their hips, I controlled the head, and the guy became compliant. More so than anywhere else, they give up in that position right away. Wow, that's awesome. just a minimal amount of pressure. Wow. Right, now there's been cases where you have to go all the way through, rolling them, lateral head displacement to get an arm out, extracting an arm, extracting a second arm. Sure. But like that's your two or three percenter. Yeah. Right, and I've had to literally do those like all the way through where I had to actually extract a second arm probably 20 times in my career where the other ones, at some point from the takedown to that end point, they became cooperative because yeah. of pressure or they knew the game was over. They're done. It's, they, they don't have anything left. Yeah. And so you just start putting all that stuff together and that's, you just start to see it. And then officers start to buy back because it's actually happening on the street. You can pressure test stuff in multiple different forms. I, I talk to people about this all the time. We pressure tested it. Okay, well, how did you pressure test it? There's levels of pressure testing. You and I could be just drilling. If you don't give me the right form, then I'm not getting any good drills out of the technique. If you're mm -hmm. just being efficient, rolling over for me. Now, when I'm drilling it, you're gonna let me do it as long as Simon says it, as long as I'm doing it okay. But if I'm not doing it right, don't just give it to me. Hmm. Yeah. Like edge weapons, do the research on how people attack you with edge weapons. That's how my bad guy has to drill it, okay? Uh, over 70% of edge weapons off this one study we, did, we use a lot, they lead with their empty hand. Why do they do that? To restrict your movement to get away. Yeah. Right? So now when we drill edge weapon defense, don't you think we should have the bad guy be leading with that hand to start to restrict their movement? Yeah, because now we have to deal with that. Yeah. Right? So a lot of it is breaking down data. Body cams are awesome. Oh, yeah. Cell phone video is awesome. Because yeah. now 
we get to break down things and then be better. Yeah. Be better. How is the bad guys attacking us? That's, That's awesome. That is awesome. You talked about a ton of great stuff. So I want to, you do travel across the country and stuff, but I want to ask one question for all the listeners out there. What is the one tip that you could offer to keep cops safe? Training consistently. So I think you have to one, be in shape and train consistently. Now listen, I am all for everyone becoming a jujitsu member and going to jujitsu and MMA gym or wrestling gym and being good at one of those two things or Muay Thai because all those fundamentals are only going to help you. Yeah. But for your average person that isn't going to do that, you can do skill building, skill fundamental drills. If you trained skill development once a week for 52 weeks this year, you're 52 times better than you were last year. Yeah, that's a good point. And I'll oh, tell wow. you what, I, I built a skill development module and it's in our online user course and it's in our instructor courses and we do that first. And then when I teach a tactic later, I'll be like, hey, these are the skills that you're good at now that you used in here that you weren't thinking of. Wow. Because when we start to drill skill development, they're like, oh, this I'll, I have to reinforce. I'm like, guys, this is not a tactic. I'm yeah. gonna, we're gonna drill this and it's not a tactic. So please don't look at me and be like, I'd never do that on the street. I get it. Yeah. But the skill that you're developing from here is going to be in all these tactics. So then say I do weapon retention. I'll be like, hey, skill development that you use in weapon retention, I'll make a list. Yeah. Good stance, level change, grip breaks. How do I break grips? Okay, how, what is one of my objectives in weapon retention? After I retain it, it's to get his hand off my gun. Yeah. Breaking a grip off my gun is what I, I have to learn to do. That's a skill. Yeah. Wow. Right? So those things all come hand in hand. So just consistent training and it, you don't got to be a jujitsu member. You don't got to be, you know, a, a world champion in jujitsu and MMA fighter to be good at combatives. You have to do continuous training though. Yeah. Uh, I always say self-defense is a myth. I get people calling me all the time. Can you come by and do a four hour block of self-defense for the women of such and such? I'll come, I'll take your money. But if you have me come and do four hours and then you never train it again and you're giving me your money and it's not worth right. it. Yeah, yeah, no right? doubt. Now if I come and do the four hour skill development block and you guys just get good at the skills, it's gonna automatically make what you're doing better. Yeah, right. I like that. It's, it's, it's like baby steps to yeah. get to the final product. Correct, and you can do it at yeah. home or with a partner before work. You don't even need mats. Like, so the skill development module is meant to be able to get people to be able to train more frequently adding tactics in is actually fairly easy. Yeah, It's just having the skill sets to be able to use the tactics after. It's kind of yeah. like, think of a long gun. We have optics on those things now. Yeah. So people are like kind of leery to shoot bilateral. But if I expose more on a barricade, if I don't, sure. Well, I, can, I don't shoot as good left-handed. I can stand still with an optic with both eyes open and punch a hole through the bullseye yeah. of it from 50 yards away because it's so accurate. It's just a weapon manipulation. Yeah. So can you train weapon manipulation without going to the range to get really good at transitioning the weapon and transferring it from, I, if I'm gonna move the weapon, I'm gonna transfer it uh, to my left side mm -hmm. and then I can engage and then I transfer it back to this side. I could do thousands of reps of that and shooting left-handed is, is easy. Yeah. Those optics in the rifle are super accurate, way more than the handgun. Yeah. To, to not do that, it's just because I don't train transferring the gun. Yeah. Mm with both eyes open, you know, before you had the argument of, well, I'm right eye dominant versus left eye dominant. Yeah. With your optic, you shoot with your eyes open. So what's the difference? Yeah, it doesn't make yeah, a difference. So yeah. now you take that argument away. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, we can be better with tactics if we can shoot bilateral. That's funny because a lot of cops think that like you're still using your whatever eye is dominant yeah. even with the optics, right? Like some guys aren't even trained to understand right. how to even use an optic. I mean, mm. Yeah. So, that, you know, that, and then you think of it this way, though. Like, if we are in a street fight and you broke your right hand and you conceal carry every day, are you going to quit conceal carrying because your right hand's out of it? Or are you going to conceal carry and just draw with your left hand? Yeah. Right? So, these things are a thing. What if you get in a fight? Oh, I, I'm, a better, I'm a better shooter right handed. Okay, but you get in a fight with, with him. Okay. If you can't shoot left handed because you're better with your right hand, you probably fight better right handed than left hand. Tuck that left hand in your pocket, can't use that in a fight. It's absolutely absurd. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So yeah, like, you're right. All that is is just consistent training. Yeah. And the, sh the shooting part with the carbine is easy. It's all the manipulation. Yeah. <laughs> it comes in between. I, th I think That's also, too, that uh, 
a concept of it all is like you're also like conditioning your brain too to like manage stress and stuff. Yeah. So these cops that get in these like high stress situations, right. like shootings and things, like all of that also applies to that, um, just based on the physical workout and, and all yeah. that, you know. So get used to being uncomfortable. Yeah. Because once you're used to being uncomfortable, it's hard to beat you. Uh, we we talk about this in like fighting and jujitsu and stuff like uh, your mind is way weaker than your body yeah. until you train it to. Yeah. Right. So if you're playing a sport and you're like, oh, I'm exhausted. My body's done. It's probably only half empty. The gas tank's half empty. Your mind is being like, I'm, I'm tired. Yeah. So yeah, you have to train true. your mind to yeah. realize that your body is stronger than what it is. You know, same thing. Hmm. That's great. Thank you. Well, dude, um, where can like people find you? Do you want to plug the, the EF combative stuff? You know, I know you guys operate the police post you know, Instagram page that a lot of cops follow, um, which puts out a lot of good content. Um, I know you're involved in all that stuff. So can you plug all that for the listeners who don't know what that is or how can they find you? Yeah. So, uh, our business Instagram is EF combatives and, uh, my personal one is W A D S V J J. And then if you guys want to email me, it's J at effective or EF combatives.com. We also have a fitness program for cops too. I truly believe that the foundation of being able to have good tactics and be good at combatives is being in shape. Uh, so if you follow them too at EF uh, Training, they have an app for cops as well. And uh, you know our website's efcombatives.com. Nice. And that's up and rolling and we're launching our online app. Uh, hopefully October 1st is our set launch date. And the good thing about that is all our instructors that come to instructor courses get access to that app for two years as long as their cert is good and then they can research online or in person and then people that overseas the department won't send them a training they just want to do a user course to get familiar with the material they can purchase the three-day module of just a user course and then they get that app for two years and they get all the videos for using it for a year or whatever. I think it's a year and then you have to update it. But nice. Perfect. No fees, so. I think you guys are changing the standard in, in law enforcement for training, okay. which is which is awesome. I mean, there's a lot of guys out there that, that you know, try to, to do what you guys are doing and you guys are doing it on like a huge scale. And yeah. so that's awesome, man. I mean, um, and thank you for carving out time during this co yeah, conference. No, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, Absolutely your question too, as far as like one thing that could make law enforcement safer is for all the training uh, companies, training instructors out there is to stop separating DT guys and gun guys, right? So we have to have the fundamentals of DT and the fundamentals of uh, firearms, handgun yeah. and firearms, but a combative situation can be both and it can go back and forth between the two. So that reality-based training, use, using ultimate training ammunition, simunitions, bringing those into that 360, 400 environment, like I've seen such growth by implementing that stuff into our department and other training places we've gone to, I've actually seen tactics become so much better. Because if I'm a DT guy and I go and I shoot paper at 70 and I suck at paper but I passed and I don't need a gun, I don't need to be good, just. I need to be a C student as a gun because mm -hmm. I'm good at DT. And then I have a 25 foot gun problem. That's an issue for me. Yeah, no doubt. And then you get that gun guy that I'm just a gun guy. I don't need DT. Well, first off, how many of your use of force is actually our gun over hands on problems? Mm -hmm. True. Okay. Two is what if I'm in a confined space and can I get that gun out and when do I present it? So bringing those two worlds together. DT guys getting off your egos and range guys getting off your egos, working together to develop programs that you can bring that 360 environment in. That's huge. I've seen that like work so well in our department. Like even to the people that are just competent. I don't train to the LCD, I refuse to, but I train to the competent person. They don't gotta be like firearms guru or DT guru. Yeah. But if they're competent, they should be able to pick up the principles, concepts and be way safer. Nice. Well it's great stuff. And you guys out there, if you're listening and you haven't heard of these guys, go check them out. Um, fantastic training can't thank you enough man um we really appreciate it you have anything mark yeah thank you for being here carving the time out of your really busy schedule at the conference to make time for us and you're really leading the evolution of what is absolutely necessary in law enforcement thank you for your time awesome yeah, thanks, thanks guys appreciate it man appreciate it hey we're out of shot fired copy additional shot fired shot fired shot fired shooting at us shooting at officers